All right, we're going to look at a new kind of automata called an NFA, or non-deterministic deterministic finite automata. And these are going to be um, used to help us show that we can do the circ operation, concatenation, on machines. That's their goal. They're allowing us to increase the, um, the uh, level of expressiveness that we have um, in uh, our way of writing down um, automata. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, to understand DFAs, Sorry, and to understand NFAs, we want to contrast them with DFAs. And it all comes down to this non-deterministic thing. What does this mean by non-determinism? Recall that a DFA was defined by a set of states Q, an alphabet sigma, a start state Q0, a transition function delta that took a Q and a sigma, and returned a Q, and then F, which was a subset of Q. And what I told you before is, is that NFAs are going to be like DFAs, but they're going to have two extra rules. Rule number one is, is that one character may go to multiple next states. So in other words, DFAs, it was always the case that we had a that we had exactly one next location for a C. But with NFAs, we can have a start location and it can go one place with a C and another place with a C, two different places. Rule number two is, is that we may move without seeing a character. And so that means that we can have an edge that's labeled with an epsilon. If it's labeled with an epsilon, that means that we don't actually need to see anything. So now, both of these new additions to DFAs are troubling because how do we know whether we're supposed to go on the top path or the bottom path? And how do we know if we're supposed to visit? Uh, how do we supposed to know if we're supposed to see a uh, character or not? This is why they are non-deterministic, because we cannot determine necessarily which way it is supposed to go. NFAs are going to be formalized almost exactly the same as DFAs. The one difference is going to be in the delta function. NFAs are going to have a delta function that is just slightly different. It's going to take a Q, and then it's going to take a maybe sigma, and it's going to return an element of the power set of Q. Let's talk about each one of these. What does it mean, a maybe sigma? That means it's going to take a sigma, i.e. a character, or not. When it doesn't, that's when it takes this epsilon. And this power set means that every time we transition, we could go to any of the other states, some subset of them. So that means that we could go to one or more of them. So this is a little bit heady. So let's step back a moment and look at an example NFA that's really simple, and then we'll work back up to doing things like concatenation. So let's, cut, let's look at an example of a machine where the third character from the end, the third character from end is one. Okay? So let's think of examples like this. So an example would be zero one zero zero, that should be in it, one zero zero one 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 should be in it, one 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 zero zero. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, lots of different things are inside of this. 
And so here's one way to write it down as an NFA. We'll have a start state. And if we see a 0 or a 1, we stay in the start state. If we see a 1, we go here. And if we see a 0 or a 1, we go there. And if we see a 0 or a 1, we go to the accepting state. Now, notice how this encodes the idea of the third character from the end being 1. If we got to the end, that means that we saw one character, two characters, three characters, where the third character was definitely a 1, and before that we saw any other thing. But now notice that this uses this feature of there being multiple destinations when we see a 1. Okay. <clears throat> so let's label these states A, B, C, D. And look at ha what happens when we run on various examples here. So let's look at this example, 0, 1, 0, 0. We would start off in the state A with 0, 1, 0, 0. And then we would go back to the state A with 1, 0, 0. Then we would go to the state B with 0, 0. Go to the state C with 0. Then go to state D with epsilon. And because D is the accepting state, we would be done. Now, this input string 0, 1, 0, 0 has another alternative way that it could run. Instead of going to B here, we could have also gone to A again with 0, 0, and then A again with 0, and then A again with empty, and then we would have said no. So both of these possibilities were possible, and so this is what we mean by non-determinism. From one input state, there are multiple end states that we could get. We could get to a state where we say yes, or we could get to a state where we say no. <clears throat> okay. Now, the first thing to realize about NFAs is that they can do everything that DFAs can do. And the reason why that's the case is that we can imagine, we can easily write a function that converts a DFA into an NFA. Actually, let's hold off that for just one second. Um, we should really define what it means to be accepted by an NFA. So we'll write the NFA semantics. It turns out that it's going to be pretty much exactly the same as usual. So X is inside of an NFA that's made up of Q, sigma, Q0, an element of Q, delta, a function that goes from Q, maybe, sigma, arrow, power set Q, and F, which is a subset of Q. If and only if, starting from Q0, X, there's some path that leads to QF and epsilon. Okay, but now the thing, so this is the same as before. The thing that will be different though is the configuration update rule. So the configuration update rule is going to have two different cases. Case number one is going to say that QI W can go to QJ W if and only if delta of QI epsilon contains QJ. So that basically says if we send in epsilon into QI, then QJ is included in that, then we're allowed to make this change. The other one says that QI CW goes to QJ W if and only if 
delta of QIC contains QJ. Now notice that because there is a set membership on both of these sides, and notice that these two situations might be identical, that's why this is non-deterministic. There are multiple ways of forming traces for a particular NFA and a particular input string, just like we saw right here where we started off here, and at this point, there were now two different rules. This rule is one use of this one, where we choose one QJ, and then the bottom path is choosing a different QJ. Okay, so now that we've done that, now we can talk about converting. So how can we convert a DFA into an NFA? Well, it's really straightforward. So we'll call convert, and it takes as input Q sigma, Q0 inside of Q, delta, which goes from Q sigma arrow Q, and F, a subset of Q. And its output will be Q prime, sigma, q0 prime, element of q, delta prime, q cross maybe, sigma, arrow power set q, and then f, oh, these are really primes, f prime subset of q. Okay, so let me go forward a little bit. Okay, now the state will actually be exactly the same. The one thing that's different is the delta function. Delta will work in the following way. Delta prime QIC will be equal to the set containing delta QIC and then delta of qi epsilon will just be equal to the empty set. So we can convert a DFA into an NFA by just saying that it in fact always returns exactly one thing and it never uses epsilons, they always go nowhere. So this is a trivial way of converting a DFA into an NFA. All right, so what next? What, what can we do next to understand NFAs? Well, this NFA semantics right here, it is quite useful because it helps us know whether or not um, a particular trace is valid and it tells us the rules for, um, for determining, for, for building traces. So let's actually try to think about operationalizing those into functions. So let's write a function that's called Oracle. And what Oracle is going to do is it's going to take an NFA. It's going to take a string. It's going to take a trace, i.e. a list of configurations. OK. And then what it's going to do is it's going to return whether or not this is a valid, a valid trace. So for example, if we gave it as an argument, this trace it would say yes, this trace it would say yes, but if we imagine that you know we, we made some third trace that said, oh, and then it just goes to D with 0, 0, then it would say, no, 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 that's not valid. That's not, that doesn't follow the rules. So that's what the purpose of Oracle is. You give it a trace and a string and it tells you this is valid or not. Okay. So Oracle is going to work like this. Its input will be W. And then it will have some sequence of traces. Okay. And it's got the NFA N. And we're going to call a helper function as usual. So this helper function, um, what's the right way to say this? Um, 
it's going to have the NFA, it's going to have Q0, it's going to have the string W, and then the traces. Okay? So H, N, Q, I, W. If it was given an empty list of traces, um, then uh, this is only valid if W is empty. Because if W is empty, then that means that there's no more characters to read, so it's okay. Okay. What though, if it wasn't given something that was empty, it was instead given at least one configuration that has QJ in it, in some new string W prime, and then some more traces T's prime. What do we do there? Well, what we want to know is whether or not um, whether or not uh, one is connected to the next. So what we say is, if w is equal to w prime, then that means that we did an epsilon transition. So what we'll do is we'll say, is it the case that qj is inside of delta qi epsilon? And if it is, then we'll and that with calling our helper function on n q j w t's prime. So we're going to check to make sure that it really is um, in the epsilon transition, or otherwise not. So otherwise, what we'll do is we'll see if w equals c w prime. Then in that case, we'll check to see that q j is a member of delta QIC, and we'll also check H N Q J W prime T's prime, and then otherwise we'll say false. So this basically says, in the trace that we were given, if the W's are the same, then that means that we must have done an epsilon transition. So we'll check that. If they're not the same, then that means that the first thing must, you know, just be one character off. And so we'll check to see if the next state is um, inside of that transition. Otherwise, we'll say that it's you know not even following the rules at all, so it can't possibly be right. This is our little oracle function. So oracle is an example of what the semantics allows us to do. The semantics allows us to look at traces and tell us whether or not those follow the rules. We could write another function that would allow us to actually generate all possible traces um, of what uh, behavior um, uh, a particular NFA might have. We call this thing a trace tree. So a trace tree either says yes or no, or it's a branch with the state that's at the top of the branch, and then, um, and perhaps also what we did to get there, and then a list of more trace trees. We'll write that as TT. TT. Okay, so we could write a function that's called um, that's called explore. Maybe is a good name for it. That takes an NFA and a string and returns. Um, and returns a trace tree that uh, says what all the different possibilities that that machine does.
So here's how we could do, here's how we could build this. So explore is going to take n and w, and it's called, we're going to call a helper function that's going to be given um, n and q0 and w. Okay. And then the helper function is going to get n, qi, and w. And here's what it's going to do. It's going to explore all the different possibilities. So it's going to explore what happens when there's a epsilon transition, what, happen, what happens when it chooses each different possible character. And then it's going to combine all those, um, uh, all those together in uh, inside of one option. Oh, you know what? I just realized something. The trace tree the definition is a little bit different than I uh, than I wrote up here. Um, this branch case is wrong. Actually, how about I just erase it? So erase this. Okay. So a branch has the state that we started in, and then it has a list of pairs of a maybe sigma and then a trace tree. So here's the state, and then this is what we did to get to it, and then that's that. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to return a branch. Oh, sorry. Another mistake. Um, okay. So if we were given epsilon, then what we'll do is we'll say if um, if qi is inside of f, then we'll return yes. Otherwise, we'll return no. So that's what we do if we actually get down to the end. Otherwise, that means that we have some character C, W. Okay, and what we're going to do here is we're going to return a branch with the state Q, I at the top, and then a list of all of the options. And what are the options? So the options are first what we would do if we chose the epsilon transition. And so that would be having, um, that would be having um, so let's call a, uh, that's the right way to say this. Yeah. So we would have um, epsilon combined with calling the helper function on n q j c w for all q j inside of delta q i epsilon. So what we're going to do is we're going to call that, loop through each one and uh, pull that, and then we're going to combine that with c of h n q j w for all q j where delta is in q i c. So what we'll do is we'll look at the delta function and we'll call it with epsilon, we'll call it with c, and then we'll loop through all of those and combine them here and we'll create this graph of all the different possibilities. So it's this explore function that we implicitly used back when we made this example right here. So what we did is we started off in the start state and with the input string. We then looked at the very next possibility for a zero, and there's only one, so that means that there's only one thing that we could have done, because everything else goes nowhere. And then we looked at um, the possibilities there, so we have these two branches, like this. And then we have each one of those only has one. 
In general, when we think about NFAs and this trace tree function, they have the possibility of quite complicated graphs. So we could start off with some start state, let's say A, and that's where we that's where we start. And then maybe we could go to a B transition, or to a B state or a C, and then maybe we could go to B or C, maybe we could go to A or B, maybe we could maybe this says no, we'll write an X down there for a no, maybe this says no, or it says, you know, A again. Maybe this one says um, says yes, and this one says no, and this one says no as well. And so this right here is an example of a trace tree. It's the sort of thing that um, that that describes the behavior of a particular um, DFA. Oh, sorry, of a particular NFA. Now, what would be nice is if we could have a way of generating this tree tree and then just finding whether or not there was a yes anywhere inside of there. Because recall with DFAs, we had the ability of taking a DFA and a string and just saying yes, this is accepted or no, it's not accepted. Well, because NFAs have this non-determinism characteristic, it's less obvious how to do that. We can't just, um, you know, uh, we, we don't know which path we're supposed to go on. And in fact, one thing that can be strange is we can actually make NFAs um, where they have infinitely large graphs where maybe this B goes back to here. How could we do that? Well, we can do it with epsilon transitions. Let me just you know have a little sidebar here and show you what I'm talking about. So we could have a machine like this where on a zero, it goes here. On a one, it goes here, and that's accepting. But then on an epsilon, it goes there, and on an epsilon, it goes here. And so this, this machine actually has an infinite number of states, sorry, an infinite number of traces, because it could keep visiting these two states over and over and over again if we were to draw it as a graph. So A, B, C. So we would start off in A, and let's imagine that the uh, string is just 0, 1. Well, we could take an epsilon transition to B, or we could look at a zero and get to B. And at this B, we could take an epsilon transition to A, or over here, we could take an epsilon transition to A, and we could take a one to C. And then this one, we could take an epsilon transition to B, or a zero to B. Over here, we could take an epsilon to B. And it turns out that this right here will just go back to that spot, and this will just go back to here, and here will go to there. So this graph right here uh, is infinitely large because of the epsilon transitions. So although it would be possible to um, make a program that constructed a trace tree and then found the check mark if there was one there, this would be a very dangerous program to run because it couldn't necessarily always do it while making sure that it stayed out of infinite behavior. So that's unfortunate. So what we'll talk about next time, I think next time, yeah, should we, yeah, I think we'll end today. Uh, we'll end this video, um, and next time we'll talk, uh, actually, you know what, yeah, screw that, yeah, we'll just keep going, <laughs> this is my first time doing these things. Okay, so how can we deal with this problem? How can we take an NFA and figure out whether or not a, a string is accepted or not without having to, um, without having to, uh, um, without having to risk doing things infinitely long? 
Well, the key idea is to realize that what we want to do is we want to do a breadth-first search of this tree right here. We, if we go in a depth-first way, then we may go down an infinite path like this, and that's dangerous. But if we do it in a breadth-first way, then we'll always then, then we'll be totally fine. So let's write a function that's called um, that's called accepts, I guess. So it takes an NFA and a string and then returns um, a bool, whether it's accepted or not. And so accepts takes as input q sigma q0 delta and f and then some string w. Right. And we're going to have a set of visited states, v, and a set of pending states that we need to visit, and really pending configurations. And this is going to start off with q0 and w. OK. All right, and we're going to say, while pending is not empty, what are we going to do? Okay. We're going to let QIW be remove from P. So we're going to move one thing from P. Okay. Then we're going to check and see. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, if w is epsilon and qi is inside of f, then we're going to return true. This is going to be the only way that we're going to be able to return true is we get to that situation. OK, so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to say for qj inside of delta qi epsilon, if mm, uh, yeah. um, if QJW is not a member of the visited things, then what we're going to do is we're going to say P is going to equal P union QJW and V equals V union QJW. So what we're doing is we are following those epsilon transitions by adding them to the Q of stuff that we're going to look at, the pending set, and we're going to add them to V, the stuff that we've already visited. Then what we're going to say is we're going to say if W equals CW prime, then for QJ inside of delta QJC, if qjw prime is not inside of v. p is going to equal p union qjw prime and v is going to equal v union qjw prime. So here, if um, w actually has something in it, then we're going to um, look at all of the transitions from there. If they're not inside of V, add them to the Q, and then add them to V. And then if we ever get to an empty set, then we're going to return false. The other thing is, is that this, uh, may, this function may run forever. Um, and it may run forever because uh, 
Um, will it run? Will it ever? No, it won't. End. Sorry, it won't ever run forever. Yeah, it won't ever run forever. <clears throat> okay, so this right here um, we call the backtracking implementation because what it does is it explores this tree and it explores down and then walks back and tries a different path if it ever uh, if it ever reaches a, a problem. So this is actually a good place to stop um, with uh, this example. Actually, you know what? Let's uh, let's let's walk through a particular example of running the accept function on uh, one machine. So let's do it on that uh, three from one machine, uh, three from the end. So on a zero or a one, we go here. On a one, we go there. On a zero or a one, and on a zero or one, we go here, which is accepting. So this is A, B, C, and D. All right, and we're going to run it on the input 0, 1, 0, 0. So the, the visited set starts off as empty, and the pending one starts off as containing A and 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay, so that's the first step. Okay, so then the next thing that we do is we pull off this, and then we um, we check to see if it, this string is empty, and it's not. We then add all of the epsilon transitions, but there aren't any. So then the next thing we do is we add all the zero transitions. So we're going to add to the set of things that have been visited a one, zero, zero. And the pending set is going to be a, one, zero, zero. All right. So then we're going to pull that off and we're going to add to the visited set A, one, zero, zero. A, zero, zero. And B, zero, zero. And then our pending set is going to be A, zero, zero, and B, zero, zero. We're going to pull off that A, zero, zero. And then our visiting, our visited set will be all of those plus A, zero. And our pending set is going to be B, zero, zero, and A, zero. Then our visit is gonna. We're gonna add to it um, C zero. Our pending set will be A zero and C zero. Then we're gonna add to it A epsilon. So then we'll have C zero and A epsilon. Then we're going to visit D epsilon. So then we'll have A epsilon and D epsilon. And then A epsilon doesn't go anywhere and it doesn't add anything more. So then V is going to be the same as it was before. And P is going to just have D epsilon. Then we're going to look at D epsilon and then that's going to say yes. So that's the whole execution of the algorithm. And if we were to draw a picture of what it did, it started with a zero a zero one zero zero, and then from there it went to a one zero zero, and then from there it went two different places. It went to a zero zero. And it went to B, 0, 0. Then it pushed this one to A, 0. Then it pushed this one to C, 0. Then it went back here and pushed that to A, epsilon. And then it went to this one and pushed that to D, epsilon. And then this one died. And then this one it said yes to. OK. So this backtracking model of exploring DFAs is a way of determining if 
something is accepted by a DFA. Okay, so this is a good place to break, and we'll come back in a little bit.